Hello folks, fancy seeing you here. It's been seconds, absolutely seconds. Great to see everybody. And uh, just many thanks to everyone who sang along for Quarantine Choir. I hope you enjoyed that today. Uh, honestly, I had such a lot of, lot of fun recording the music for today. That gorgeous bit of plain chant. Um, there's so much uh, so much to be gained from, from looking at this music, uh, particularly this medieval style. There's a huge amount of study um, being done by well, tweed-wearing and, and corduroy-wearing professors in, in universities all around the world. I thought today, well, we've been looking at Baroque music the last couple of weeks, everyone. I thought today, let's have a look at medieval music. Uh, so let me just quickly, actually, Jim, why don't we just wait for just a two moments for people to arrive so and see the numbers are shooting up again. Hello to everybody. Great to see you. Glenis says we must stop meeting like this. <laughs> And uh, Colette missed last week. She was running granny school. Oh, okay. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. The sound is funny, is it? Is the sound all right for everybody? I'm like, talking is like a fugue. Oh, okay. Interesting. What about... Ah. That's a bit odd. Is that better? Let me know if the sound has improved. If not, I might need to do the restart thing. Sound okay. Fab. Okay. If it doesn't work, just refresh. All right, everybody. So I'm going to make a start, folks. Thank you so much uh, for being here today. Uh, the Deep Dive, well, this is our exploration into some of the more, I think, fascinating, interesting uh, and important developments in these musical styles. We were talking about Baroque music last week and the week before, but we're going to we're going to go back hundreds and hundreds of years uh, before the Baroque era, everybody. So welcome to the deep dive and let's dive in. So first thing, let's have a look at the musical periods timeline here on screen. Of course, this is this is about as simplified as it as it gets. You know, big, big, chunky colours, uh, big blocks, it, almost as if there was a, a moment, as I've said before, on January the 1st in uh, 1600, where everybody woke up and went, oh good, that's the Renaissance done, time for the Baroque era. It doesn't work like that. These are very, very rough approximations, but what I think is very, very interesting is to see how the pace of human development and particularly cultural and musical development, you see how things are speeding up as technology develops. That's a really important aspect to all of this. Um, but let's, let's start by talking about this medieval era here. You can see on screen that we're talking about a, a substantial block of time, best part of a thousand years. In fact, some uh, some academics think it lasted, you know, it will include everything from uh, from the time of Christ right up until, uh, the, yeah, the mid-1400s, maybe in the 1500s. Uh, so so really, the, the main thing to say about the medieval era is it's, uh, it, it, really, we don't know very much about it, ladies and gentlemen. There's not a lot in the way of authentic sources that survive to this day. Uh, certainly not a lot, well, certainly no recordings, very, very few instruments, more pictures of instruments and even then uh, since we're talking pre-renaissance art uh, you know people didn't really have a sense of drawing with perspective we don't know how big things were we don't know how they worked uh, a lot of the stuff that we we say we know about medieval music is guesswork or comes from fairly detailed study of uh, original sources that survive. Now, at this point, we need to talk about who was actually writing all this stuff down. Now, many of you will already know the answer to this. It's pretty obvious if you think about the style of music that we've just been singing. But we have to think about who had the ability to read and write in this this dark period. We can see here, yeah, they call it the Dark Ages, not because people couldn't see anything, but because we just don't know what went on because very little has survived for various reasons. Who had the ability to read and write? Well, it was clerics, it was scholars, it was those who worked in the church, uh, it was monastic types. Basically, those who were educated usually were associated with the church uh, or had rich patrons and so on. So these were the only people who were writing down anything, uh, let alone writing down music. So 
it's important to note that there, folks. We've got nearly a thousand years where we don't know really what went on. A lot of the stuff is very indistinct, but a lot started during this medieval period. Now, just to uh, to show us here on screen, you can see next to the black block, you've got the, the blue block of the Renaissance. We've been singing a lot of Renaissance music uh, on the channel. Now, a lot of the rapid development of music in the Renaissance era was due to the development of movable type as we've spoken about on the channel, uh, and the ability then to print scores and have them uh, uh, very, very quickly and very, very cheaply uh, reproduced and sent all around Europe, that is to say the known world at the time. Uh, and so that was how composers started to share their music. Of course, by the time you get into the Baroque era, you're talking about a much more established musical scene. You're talking about uh, concerts taking place, performances. Music really came into its own in the Baroque. And then you see the periods of music shrinking as, as uh, time goes on, because, of course, as technology accelerated, as we had the Industrial Revolution, which meant we could craft uh, more intricate and more interesting instruments that had more notes. It meant music became more complicated. And, of course, if you try and break the 20th century down into eras, well, it's impossible. There are so many different uh, styles and genres. A lot of that's down to recording technology and digital technology and so on. So let's let's go back. Let's have a look at some medieval music. OK, everybody. So here's an example of a bit of medieval uh, music written down. And you'll look at that and you'll think, well, first of all, I like the nice letter O. I think that's the first thing to acknowledge. That's a beautifully illuminated letter. But you can also see um, some rather beautifully written uh, text coming up horizontally from that. But then above and below, you see all these little diamonds and lines. And you look at it and you think, you know, it does look a lot like musical notation. And you'd be right. Because uh, what we're looking at here, ladies and gentlemen, these are neumes. Okay, it's a great word, neumes. It was one of the first words that uh, that we were taught here in Bristol at university. Uh, our teacher, uh, a man called uh, Wyndham Thomas, who was a medieval specialist, and he would uh, quite frequently spend entire summers in France visiting, uh, visiting ancient abbeys and uh, doing brass rubbings and so on. So he taught us about neumes. I'll never forget him. And the interesting thing about these little symbols is that these are, they're like the Rosetta Stone for us in terms of our connection to the past. We we know now, because so much was written down about neumes, what they meant, and knowing what they mean means we, we can unlock some of the, the, the slightly older, the even older uh, musical notations, such as the ancient Greek, the Egyptian, the Babylonian um, musical notation systems. But these these little dots, these diamonds and squares, as Helene said, these were the first example of a way of writing musical notation down in a way that captured, and this is the important thing, not just the pitch of the note, but what happened to the note once you've sung it. And that's important. A lot of, uh, of cultures, I've already named a few, Egyptian, Greek and so on, had, had written music down in some form, but had done so in a very, very kind of theoretical way. Um, hadn't actually captured what it was about the tones and the pitches and the notes that, that that created that specific melody it was more a case of well this is you know if you if you it was assigning notes to letters of the alphabet and and and, and quite difficult to to write a piece of music down to actually compose it was more sort of an expression i think is the way to put it so these neumes were the first time anyone had actually written it down and tried to accurately represent pitch and changes of pitch. And the name, where does neum come from? Well, we think, we think it came from uh, the medieval Latin pneuma, as in pneumatic and pneumonia, uh, which itself came from the ancient Greek uh, pneuma, meaning breath. Okay, so we think that's where it came from. It would make sense, wouldn't it, if each, each, each of these was a breath. Uh, and in fact, it's a more more of a kind of a portion of breath rather than a breath on its own. So let's talk about the neumes. You know, we've just been having a look at them, and just to show you that picture again, you can see some of them have got some funny little shapes. And this one here at the top, I, actually, you can't see the mouse point. There's no point in showing you. Uh, along the top line, you see some of them are sort of on top of each other and squashed. So what do they mean? Well, here, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and there there will be a test at the end. There won't be a test. Uh, th this is a chart showing you all the various permutations and variations of neumes that you can uh, you can see in music. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit so we can see some of these at the top. Um, 
so what we've got here is the modern equivalent and so from that uh that version of o come uh, come come Emmanuel that we were singing you saw a an up to date printing of of plain chant if you sing in a church choir you'll see these in the back of the hymn book uh so you see this note here this one is called the punctum and there you've got the virga now you'll see these written down in actual fact uh, for the most part, they are identical. If you see just a little dot on its own, uh, and that can and that can be written in this square notation, Helen, just for you, you see here, it can have a tail or not. Some people think that the uh, the virga was was used to illustrate descending notes. Others say they can find examples where it was used on ascending notes. Uh, a lot of people just think the monks who were writing these liked the the kind of feel of the quill kind of scratching down on the paper so there was a sense of oh well let's add a nice tail to make it look good in actual fact we think that there's no difference between these two but then things start to get interesting here when we look at this shape here the pes okay which is an ah where you sing the first note and then move up and you can see in this little shape here this is rather fascinating that you the, f the first block this square is connected to the top block with a little line at the top if you can see so that's the pes, that's up, that's an ascending uh, ascending movement. And then coming down the clevis is ah. So you can see on the next one along, you've got the, the line at the top connected to the little square at the bottom. We've then got the torculus, ah, where we start on one, go up and back down again. Next to that, the porectus. I am not expecting people to remember these words because apart from anything else, they're hilarious. Ah. That you'd get at the end. Amen. Okay, you, you may have seen that little shape. Uh, we've got the uh, Climacus, ah, where the first note is lent on. Uh, we've got the Scandicus, which is the other way, ah, and so on. So all of these little neumes, all of these have different shapes. And you can see from this chart, which I'm going to shrink down again so we can see it all, uh, or most of it on the same screen, that there are so many different versions, so many iterations of these, but they all kind of line up with each other. And uh, notice a lot of these are French. Most of these uh, of these neumes were designed, um, were, were, were implemented in the abbeys of medieval France. Uh, there was a huge amount of, uh, of influence from this area, and actually you know, the French, uh, we owe a huge debt uh, to the, the monks and priests of medieval France for this system. So let's have a little look at what that means for us with Veni, Veni Emmanuel. We can see here on screen, this is the score we were just singing. Okay, so we've got the uh, da, 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 da. I think everyone could follow that when you were singing earlier on, but then we've got this da, 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 with this little thing here. Now this little shape, da, 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 wasn't on the previous list, so I've put it at the bottom. This is called a quilisma. Isn't that a nice one? A quilisma. Ah, where you start below, you go above, and then you go to the middle. So, veni, veni, Emmanuel. And then you see a little vertical line, that's to illustrate where you take a breath. And then, captivum solve Israel. And there you have that descending pattern. You can uh, go through, you can uh, name all of those neumes if you want to. Uh, there are many, many academics who enjoy a tenured life um, arguing with other academics all around the world as to whether or not uh, the punctus or the, uh, the the virga or so on is the uh, the more prominent note. There is no way to tell, and they're quite happy with that because they've got tenure, uh, and they'll just keep arguing <laughs> about that uh, till the cows come home. Fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, we've been left this music by, uh, by well, through, through fortune uh, and through for our, our own good luck, and it has influenced so much music since. If we look at this uh, this system here, it's quite easy then to look at something from not that long ago. This is only from the late 19th century, this score, and you can see the connection with uh, the previous notation system. Draw nigh, draw nigh, Emmanuel. You know, we're still not looking at um, tempo, we're not looking at rhythms, we don't have crotchets and quavers and semiquavers but we're seeing things starting to take shape, and this is now looking a little bit more familiar. All right, so how's everybody doing? Uh, now, lots of people are asking about cadences and so much. There are no cadences 
in this style of music. This is all pre what we consider to be tonal music. Okay, uh, there no no sense of cadences, no sense of chords. Forget chords one, four, five, and so on. This didn't start developing until the Renaissance era, where people stopped thinking about lines like this and started thinking about chords. Now, this style, this single line, is very much uh, an example of early medieval music. Let me show you here, folks. So the the earliest form of music that we can uh, we can identify is this style uh, which is mainly monophonic and you remember from the deep dives those of you that were studying with me on the music theory monophony is just one line here is a little bit of monophonic plane chart have a listen here we go So we can hear we had a, a solo voice sing the line and everybody else sings a monophonic line. One line, everyone all singing together. Of course, that takes a huge amount of practice, a huge amount of, uh, of effort. And, and one of the reasons why these tunes were written down, of course, is that you had a large group of people who had to sing all together, all in unison. Uh, and imagine being the new boy. <laughs> Uh, having to learn it very quickly. A lot of it was written down to help people uh, catch up quickly and not spoil that wonderful, very, very pure sound. It's really, really hard singing monophonic plain song, folks, I'm, so, I'm sure you can imagine. And what's really fascinating, and again, I could spend months talking about the development of just plain song. Each of these, uh, the, the, I've got these up on screen, these uh, European centres, the chant developed individually and separately in the centres all around the uh, early uh, Judeo-Christian religion. Uh, in Rome, in Hispania, in Gaul, in Ireland and more, all around the world, these beautiful melodies used for chanting started to be written down and then shared. And this is how we get some of these very, very early, very, very early uh, tunes like O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And this is why a lo you, you, when you listen to a piece, it's quite easy sometimes, once you've got your ear in, to say, well, that's, a, that's from Spain. I can hear that's from Spain. I can hear that's from Ireland because of the way that the, uh, the scales are used, the way that the, uh, the music has developed from the kind of cultural utterances of the people uh, that were around when they were when they were composed. So mainly monophonic music. Now, interestingly, what happened around the end of the ninth century is um, singers in monasteries, including Switzerland, it seems to be Switzerland was the birthplace of this. They started experimenting with adding another line to that monophonic sound. So we've had this. Okay. Now, what they would do is they would add something in parallel motion. So, um, here on screen, I've got this nos qui vivimus benedictimus domi, and so on. Okay, so if we play the tune at the top, nos qui vivimus benedictimus, and so on. If I add the organum part below, and this is this technique's called organum, we get. That does sound quite um, well. As I would say to my students at uh, at school when I was teaching, it would sound quite monkey, monkish. Okay, you can hear. And we've all heard that kind of music before. This is called organum. Here's a little example of organum, but sung. And this would have come from, as I say, around the ninth century, around the year one thousand people were singing like this. Have a listen. So that's the intonation now. Alleluia. 
So you can hear that. It, it can hear the start of harmony. Your ear, I don't know about you, my ear is trying to latch on to various intervals and try and make sense of it harmonically. Of course, that's impossible. There was no underlining, uh, underlying harmonic structure to any of that. It, it's very much a case of if your line goes up, this line may go down or it may come up depending on which neum this particular phrase is influenced by. Um, but one of the things you'll have noticed if you sang O Come, O Come, Emmanuel is that sense of contrary motion, of interweaving lines where sometimes the, the the prime part the primus part is up here sometimes the secunda part is up here and you get this interplay of these voices they they are equal uh, and organum is the, the is a very important aspect really in the development then of um, of what followed which is individual lines working together to create actual chords and uh, that's a big moment in music now before that happens um I want to talk to you very briefly about uh, the Notre Dame School. I've, and obviously I've said France is a, a, a huge, huge uh, melting pot at this point for musical. All of this, uh, uh, all these neumes and all of these new styles are, are spreading out from France throughout Europe. Uh, some of it's heading over to, to us here in, in England. Uh, it wasn't the United Kingdom at that point. Uh, and so, uh, you know, th this, this Notre Dame style... Well, have a little listen to it, because we've just been listening to Organum. At the same time, you've got another school which sings over a drone, where you just get this... That sort of idea. We just hold a note... Singing over a held note. The Notre Dame school combines the two, so you have a drone, but the drone moves. Have a listen. This is fascinating. So you can hear. Okay. Thanks, boys. <laughs> so you can hear. What, what's fascinating about that, I think, is that because that drone note, it can move, it adds a sense of anticipation to the music that's not there when you're singing, uh, when you're listening to monophonic plain chant or even organum. What you get there is, oh, the bass note, that created an interesting sound, that created an interesting chord. I wonder what is going to happen next. Uh, and that creates a sense of movement, that creates a sense of momentum that, as I say, hadn't existed in music before, which I think is the birthplace of rhythm and the birthplace of pulse in music. Absolutely fascinating. Now, I can see we're running out of time, everybody. I just want to leave you with a couple of other little strands, because all we've spoken about today is one really narrow little field. Uh, these, these monks working hard in medieval France and Switzerland to develop these styles. But... There's lots of, lots of other styles going on in the medieval era at the same time. So let me just tell you a couple of bits about these, because this is, again, I think is fascinating. So you've got the monastic style where you're developing Gregorian chant, as we would call it. Um, you're developing organum, you're developing this Notre Dame style. There are two other musical styles at the time, which I'm just going to mention today, and maybe we'll dive deeply into them another time. First was the liturgical drama, and this is really, really interesting. You'll find at the turn of the first millennium uh, that there was a musical tradition in Europe which derived text from what were called the tropes. And tropes, well, and tropes today, uh, they can come to mean, you know, the things that you expect to see on TV. Oh, it's a, there's another trope in that particular show. Oh, well, he saved the day. That's a trope. But the original tropes were poetic kind of discussions and embellishments on liturg liturgical texts from around the 10th century. And people, particularly usually wealthy people, uh, would sit around and act out these scenes and, uh, and embellish them and make them more interesting and, and more lively. And often they would have music. And so around the year 1000, you started to get the first Christmas and Easter plays actually written with really detailed stage directions, with characters, these survive to the present day. They're so, so clear 
and so well written that these plays can be performed today. You can see the story of Daniel, uh, which has been performed dozens and dozens of times, for example, and it's clear that there was music written for these liturgical plays. Uh, the great Hildegard of Bingen, who I will do a session on at some point, amazing composer, uh, raising Renaissance woman as well, uh, she wrote music for liturgical plays. The other style of music, which again we will be talking about on a future deep dive, is sung by these these chaps, these goliards, and these were the these were the the travelling minstrels. Uh, these were the the poet musicians of Europe, and they would wander around from town to town. They were usually either scholars or priests. Um, not always scholars or priests who had uh, who had. Uh, acted in in the best interests of the church. Let's put it that way. In Japan, uh, when samurai uh, were were left or bereft of their family, they were known as ronin. These roaming samurai, and these were sort of roaming scholars, roaming priests, uh, and they would write and sing songs in Latin. Now, most of their poetry, well, some of their poetry was sacred and so on, but a lot of it, a lot of it is, shall we say, secular, and even more of it is profane, and some of it is downright rude. All right, this is all music dealing with drunkenness, debauchery, lechery, just the worst. The kind of music that you'd expect to hear in the pub. And what I love about this uh, this sort of spectrum of music is that you've got everything from the very, very devout monk who's sitting in his cell writing out the, the, the music for the service next week, all the way through to a whole load of bored nobles sitting around acting out tropes and playing and, and saying, no, you got that wrong, let's let's start again from the start of the scene and so on. And then in the pub, you've got the Goliards who are singing these songs about, well, uh, I can't necessarily tell you what they were singing about because this is a family show, ladies and gentlemen, but if you're interested, well then, can I advise you to look up perhaps the most famous collection of uh, Goliard chansons, which is known as the Carmina Barana. And, of course, you may know Carmina Barana because it was very famously set to music by uh, Karl Orff in the 20th century, and you know O Fortuna. But it was originally written by these itinerant poet musicians of Europe. Let me play you a little bit of this. This is a little bit of the medieval Carmina Barana. You're going to hear some instruments here as well. These are authentic instruments from the time. Here we are. It's a little bit of Carmina Barana. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd love to sit you and, and play you the entire Carmina Barana, uh, but I see we have run out of time for today. Can I honestly urge you, those of you who have found today even slightly interesting, have a look for a performance of the Carmina Barana, and I don't mean the Orff version, marvellous as it is, I mean this ancient, ancient collection of frankly bawdy songs. If you listen to them as background music as you go around the kitchen, you won't notice the subject matter, you'll just be transfixed uh, by the beautiful, beautiful melodies and these really interesting sound worlds that that sound familiar, but at the same time a thousand miles away and a thousand years away from where we are. So everybody, I hope you've enjoyed today. Um, do, as I say, seek out that music. Next week, well, we'll have a deep dive into another area of music history and we'll be looking at uh, history for a few weeks yet. Uh, the theory will be back next year, but I want to get stuck into perhaps some romantic music next week. We'll see what takes my fancy. So everybody, thank you so much for your time today. I hope you've enjoyed it, as I said. I'll be back tomorrow with Din Deerin, but in the meantime, have a great day, everybody. Take care. Be well. See you soon.